Hello, everyone, and welcome back to One Civil Law, where we learn through the misfortunes of others. We are continuing our coverage of the Chad Daybell trial. We are continuing the cross-examination of the state's first witness, Detective Ray Hermosillo. Detective Ray has walked us through basically a timeline of the entire case from the time in which the grandmother gave the police a request for a welfare check through the discovery of the bodies in the yard of Chad Daybell and the discussion of some of the autopsy. We have already begun cross from the defense who came in quite hot and quite belligerent in a way that was, partic was not particularly helpful. He came in in a very accusatory, belligerent, unrefined tone. And he seemed to be like play, trying to play these like little gotcha games, which didn't really go anywhere. And it wasn't really productive in my humble estimation. But that's where we are at. You know, little dickish things, like little tiny things. Like, you know, isn't it true that, you know, a defense lawyer or a prosecution wouldn't do this or a detective wouldn't do that? And you would never do this or never do that. I'm like, no, not really. I, I don't think so. And the detective mostly said so as well. It's like, yeah, a prosecution wouldn't go to the scene of the crime and do an investigation. It's like, well, they might. It's happened. But it's not common, is it? Well, it depends on the kind of case, I guess. So, like, you know, it's little, little ticky-tacky stuff. You know, oh, you, you didn't think to record the conversation you had. Well, I wasn't required to. It was a conversation in the field. I'm not required to record those conversations. Did you have a microphone? No. Did you have a cell phone? In the car. Does the cell phone have the ability to record audio? I guess. Dun, dun, dun. Right? That kind of shit. And it's like, well, you didn't think to record or to ask someone else to record. I'm like, no, I guess not. Because it's not part of our standard procedure. So I suppose I could have, but I didn't because it's not what we typically do or it's not what we do every time. And I didn't see the particular need to do it on this particular occasion, I guess. I don't know what you want from me. It just felt very... The, the, the style of questioning was overly overly combative when it was not warranted and also kind of left him nowhere to go in short of uh, the thing. Also, during the lunch break, I've discovered that the Biden administration, more properly, the ATF finally revi issued its revised final rule on what it means to be engaging in the business of dealing firearms. So I was trying to read that a little bit as we were talking, but I haven't gone very far yet. It's 466 pages. So, you know. I was trying to see if they had like a clean definition. Like where did they get to the point? And so let's see where they actually try to define this. All right, blah, 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 blah. Okay, that's the proposal of the rule. Where is the actual rule? Okay, I think this is the rule. I wonder if I can like look this up, like if this has just been amended in the CFR already. That would make my life easier. ECFR. Has this been updated? I don't think the CFR has been updated yet. No, it hasn't been updated yet. The rule has been published, but not updated in the CFR.
Uh, that is not helpful. A red line CFR would be nice, yeah. I mean, presumably it's in here somewhere. Okay, yeah. All right, here we go. It's at the bottom. It's at the bottom of the regulation. Okay. All right, yeah. Okay, great. All right, dealer. A dealer. A dealer is any person engaged in the business of selling firearms at wholesale or retail, any person engaged in the business of repairing firearms or of making or fitting special barrels, stocks, or trigger mechanisms to firearms, or any person who is a pawnbroker. The term shall include any person who engages in such business or occupation on a part-time basis. The term shall include such activities wherever or through whatever medium they are conducted, such as a gun show or event, flea market, auction house, gun range, or club, at one's home, by mail order, over the internet, e.g., online broker or auction, through the use of online means, e.g., text messaging service, social media raffle, or website, or at any other domestic or international public or private marketplace or events. Okay. Anyone who's engaged in the business of buying or selling firearms. Okay, I'm not sure how helpful that is, to be honest. Okay. Personal collection, or personal collection of firearms, or personal firearms collection. General definition. Personal firearms that a person accumulates for study, comparison, exhibition, e.g. collecting curio or relics, or collecting unique firearms to exhibit at gun club events, or for a hobby, e.g. non-commercial, recreational activities. For personal enjoyment, such as hunting, skeet, target, or competition shooting, historical reenactment, or non-commercial firearm safety instruction. The term shall not include any firearm purchased for the purpose of resale with predominant intent to earn a profit. In addition, the term shall not include personal firearms accumulated primarily for personal protection. So I guess the guns I have, the guns I have for personal protection are not in my personal collection, by definition. That's an interesting choice. This is exhibit 34, sorry, which 34 has sub-exhibits, I believe it's an age 34 A is admitted previously by stipulation, 34 I'll give you a link to the final rule. Yes, Judge. You can read for yourself. There's some... To the the amended CFR is at the end. Okay, it so it's not updated sorry, in the, uh, it's not updated on the uh, EC, it's not updated on the so Code of Federal La like Regulations National Archives site yet. But they, uh, <laughs> it's at the end of the regulation if you want to read it for yourself. Okay. And what is that date? October 12th of 2019. Okay, now what was the date that allegedly Tammy Daybell was shot out with a paintball gun? October 9th, 2019. So if I understand, the, the incident with the paintball gun took place three days before the search took place. Correct. Okay. But you still continue to believe that was the basis for someone going after uh, Tammy Daybell. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. All right. But you don't have any Google searches that suggest anything else in a threatening matter. This is the one and only that you're relying on. Is that right? No, that's not right. All right, what else are you relying on? If you scroll up on October 9th, I believe that evening. Okay. Go ahead. Alex Cox Googles. How to make an AR-15 function in cold weather. Okay. Um, there's some other Googles if you'd like to pull up. Well, I've got those, and we're going to go through those. 
and we'll have an opportunity to do that. But when that was when that was the only time you were shot at. Okay. And he and he Googled that night, right? That's correct. What time of night was that, do you recall? I have to look at my notes. Okay. Okay, but he also had a habit of Googling a lot of things, right? I can't answer that. Well, you talk you you know about the head of elector thing, right? No, sir. Oh, okay. You no longer need a permit for concealed carry in Texas. Well, before we get to the head of elected thing, let's talk a little bit about some of the other searches from Homer J. Maximus. October 21, best tactical cutting moves, right? Correct. See that one? All right, Mr. Pryor, you're going to have to stay by that microphone or we don't pick up what it's said. Good judge. October 22nd, 2019. Sharpening swords, knife sharpener, right? Correct. Okay, what was the date of um, Tammy Daybell's death? October 19th, 2019. Okay, so three days after Tammy Daybell dies, Alex Cox is still looking at sharpening swords and a block knife sharpener three days after Tammy Daybell's death. Is that right? Correct. Okay. October 23rd. Four days after Tammy Daybell's died. 15 facts about the silence and the lambs you didn't know. Call that one? No, sir. Okay. And that was three, four days after Tammy dies, right? That's your, okay. Now, when you searched, um, and I, I believe it was um, 107. Was that the unit that we found all of the knives and the guns? No, sir. That was 175. Okay, 175. That was Lori Vallow's unit then, right? That was the unit that Lori Vallow lived in, but Alex Cox was on the uh, tenant agreement. Okay. Okay. And your testimony previously, I believe that was a day or so ago, it was there were a significant number of uh, weapons found, right? That's your did you do a check on all of those weapons to see who they belong to? I personally did not do a check on all those weapons. What about the knives or the ammunition? Did you check and see who those belong to? I'm not quite sure how to check on who the knives I don't belong either. to. I don't either. I just asked because I... So um, are you presuming that the owner of those knives and guns and ammunition is Alex Cox? They were found amongst his belongings, so I'll have your knives. And we talked about this before um, when I was doing some one year and eight of objection uh, that a lot of those items were items, the knives and the, the ammunition were items that he pulled out of bags and displayed for purposes of, of um, for lack of a better word, staging them for your photo op, right? That's correct. Okay. Okay. But again, the all of the ammunition, all of the weapons, all of the knives and the, the, the ski mask. That was uh, found in Alex Cox's, uh, had or near Alex Cox's belongings, right? Correct. So you're, I don't want you to speculate, but you're presuming that Alex Cox owned all of those, right? That's correct. There's no indication that uh, that Lori Vallow had several guns and knives and things like that. Is that fair? That's fair. Okay. <clears throat> I want to switch gears a little bit. Um,
And I want to talk to you a little bit about um, Charles Mallow. Okay. okay. And I assume you've been communicating with the folks down in Arizona about all of that. Is that fair? Yes. Okay, so you're well versed in the facts as it relates to Charles Mallow, correct? Um, no, I wouldn't say well versed. I know the basics. Okay, but are part of the basics to know uh, where the court proceedings are and who was charged with what? Um, you would have to be more specific. Okay, and, and do you know currently who's charged in the death of Charles Ballow? Uh, yes. Okay, who is that? Lori Mello. Okay, are, are, you, are you aware that the prosecuting attorney down in Maricopa County issued a objection here saying? That's the same. As I'm asking whether he's aware, not whether he. Well, by the time you say what he's aware of, then all the information is coming through his so it's sustainable. Okay. Are you aware that Chad Daybell is not charged with anything in Maricopa County relating to Charles Mallow? Yes, I am. Okay. Okay. Brandon Boudreaux's next. Who's been charged in the allegations against Brandon Boudreaux? Lori Bellum. Is there anybody else? Not that I'm aware. Okay, and you're also aware that, Char that Chad Daybell has not been charged in the allegations as they relate to Brandon Boudreaux. Is that right? That's right. Okay. Now, if Alex Cox was still alive, uh, there's the suggestion seems to be that he would have been charged with uh, both of those offenses. Would that be fair? Objection calls for speculation. So okay. Do you do you have any information as to who killed Charles Vallow? Uh, yes. Who do you believe killed Charles Mallow? Alex Cox. Okay. Who do you believe took the shot at Brandon Boudreaux? Alex Cox. Okay. Thank you. Now, did you have the occasion to um, look into the history of Alex Cox a little bit? Uh, briefly. Okay. Were you aware of an incident that occurred in, um, let me get the date right, August 5th of 2007? You'd have to be more specific about what occurred on the day, sir. On that day, uh, there was an allegation that uh, there was an assault on a um, Joseph Ryan. That's correct. You're familiar. You're familiar with that, is that right? Yes. And in 2007, is there any indication that Chad Daybell knew Lori Vallow in 2007? Not to my knowledge, no. Okay. And in that incident, are you aware that uh, Alex Cox committed aggravated assault on Joseph Ryan? Your Honor, this point I'm going to object to relevance. I think we're outside the scope of what's happening in this case, Mr. Pryor. Judge, can I approach, please, with counsel? Sure, I'm outside Washington. Exciting. <laughs> Let's talk about some things that, you know, he's not charged with, I guess. How y'all doing out there in uncivil law land? You feeling good? The case I'm working on has already been cited 135 times? How's that even possible? <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Oh, it's the earlier appeal. Oh, that makes a little bit more sense. Okay. Why not Texas? Texas is awesome.
Yeah, I don't, I don't know if uppity is exactly the right word for it, but I understand what you mean. Yeah, it's just a question of can we find exactly the right adjective here at this point. I find him to be aggressive, belligerent, dismissive, unduly confrontational. A little uncontrolled. The man could use a breathing exercise or two. Is it too late to choose him from yoga? That'd be good. You feel like you're hate watching prior? He's not helping. He's certainly not helping. The state came There's in right. with a per but perfectly calm, somewhat detached, to direct. He's like, uh, dude, man. Confirms that. You need to. You need to. Uh, you need to slow your roll. Uh, putting under 403, it's not relevant for the purposes of this case. Judge, based on that ruling, the state would move to strike the question. All right, my question is straight to that topic won't be uh, allowed. I would like to talk to you a little bit about um, Chad Abel's phone, and I'd like you to refresh my recollection. Okay? Yeah. You made mention that on the 26th, when you were uh, doing the initial uh, welfare check, you followed up with calls to uh, Mr. Daybell, is that right? That's right. And your testimony was that um, you weren't able to get an answer or the phone was turned off? Every time we call the one street to force me like we call. Oh, all right. Um, did you have an opportunity to read, go through Mr. Daybell's phone records? I personally have not. No. So there's no indication that the phone was ever turned off, was there? I can't testify that I didn't go through these records. But, but you can testify that it just went to this. I have a sneaking right. suspicion right. I'm going to have to bend the case okay. law. Now, hmm. when you searched Lori Vallow's residence, uh, there weren't any clothes in there, in the residence that she had hanging up with the hangers, right? That's correct. Do you have any information to suggest that she had mailed or shipped her clothes to another location? No, I don't. Okay. And then you, uh, um, at the time you were aware that Mr. Daybell obviously was, was married to Ms. Ms. Fallow at that point. Is that correct? That's correct. And is it your allegation that Mr. Daybell left on the 26th or 27th and also tried to avoid uh, contact with law enforcement? I can't answer why Mr. Daniel left. All I can answer to you is I wasn't able to get a hold of him after that date. Okay, and after that date, did you happen to check credit cards or phone records or anything like that to try to locate him? Again, sir, I didn't go through Mr. Daniel's phone records. Okay. Did you did you gain any information that Mr. Daybell was going on a vacation around the 26th or 27th of that the end of the month? We later learned uh, that Mr. Daybell was in California. Okay, and later learned that he was in California, and that was about the time of the 28th or 29th of November, is that right? I'd have to refer to my notes. Okay, and were you aware of right. that? Okay, and again, I, maybe the coffee's still affecting me. I'll try to slow down, okay? Uh, but you're also aware that Mr. Daybell on the 28th being at Knott's Ferry Farms, right? Correct. And that was a family vacation with his kids, correct? Uh, I, I can't testify to who was there. Okay, so Mr. Davo wasn't fleeing. He was on the 26th or 27th of the month when uh, Maury Vallow's closet was empty. Mr. Davo was on a family vacation. Idaho is pretty awesome. I can't testify that he wasn't. I believe fleeing. it. I can testify that Doesn't he Aaron Paul live in uh, Idaho? Okay. And you know that later date was the end of November, right? Close to that date. Worked so for him, I guess. Okay. And you know that subsequently I think he's from that, Idaho. he went on a trip to uh, Hawaii after that, right? Yes, he was in Hawaii after that. Right. So if, if I understand the testimony, Mr. Daybill was uh, at some point after the 26th, went on a planned family vacation at Knox Ferry Farms, right? Uh, I can't testify it was a planned family vacation. Okay, all right, that's okay. And then subsequent to that, he then went to Hawaii on a trip to Hawaii where there was some contact with you folks, correct? 
Uh, yeah, we made contact with Mr. Dave in Hawaii. Okay. And how is it that you found out that he was in Hawaii again? Remind me. Please. Through tips that came in through uh, our hotline that we had set up and cell right. phone data. Did, and, and this is just a question. I'm, I'm kind of curious. Did maybe you just look at uh, plane records? Are you asking? Yeah, about I'm asking. Did you guys look at three? I can't. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry, sir. Can you repeat the question, please? Did you just, did at any time, did you just take the initiative to look at plane records? So each officer was tasked with different things. Okay. Uh, we did have an officer that looked to finance okay. financial, and I assume he did look through plane records and credit cards. Okay. And uh, if Mr. Davo was flying on a commercial plane, or traveling from Boise to uh, Knott's Berry Farm on a commercial plane, in your experience and knowledge of these things, there would have been a record of that, right? So that's correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Now, um, I'm going to switch gears again a little bit, okay? Please, please forgive me because... Uh, I'll forgive sure you if you calm subjects. down. And before we go there, I want to make sure you did get a subpoena from my office. Is that correct? That's correct. And you acknowledge that you've accepted that, correct? Correct. Right. And you were kind enough to contact my office and agree that if I need you to come back, you'll you'll come back in a time of a suitable for both of us. Is that fair? Yes. Was there anything else discussed during that phone conversation? They said I couldn't get back. Okay, and that was because we're not going to get into this on. on to let everybody know this is nobody else's business, but you have an obligation of some sort, and, and I've acknowledged that, and we're going to work on that. Is that fair? Objection elements? Sustain. Okay. Are now, you just trying to make yourself seem like a good um, person? Is that why you're asking those questions? I'm a good I'm person. Be specific to JJ Ballard, okay? Yeah. Um, the last known sign of life was the 22nd is that fair the last the last time the name was september 22nd 2019. toddy right okay toddy's not bad the last um at least proof of of life for um tiny ryan was september 8th of 2019. Of so i'll do the math in my head if i can there's 15 days difference between Tylee Ryan and JJ Vallow. Is that correct? For the last last proof of uh, of living or life. Respect. Rough, yeah, roughly 15 days. You, you think JJ? You want me to come visit Idaho? Died on around the night of September Maybe. 8th or 9th of September, and Tylee was the 22nd or 23rd. Is that fair? That's fair. Okay, thank you. Now, as part of the um, investigation, uh, you looked into um, where J.J. Vallow was on the 22nd of September, correct? Correct. And on the evening of the 22nd of September, he was at Lori Vallow's home. That's correct. Okay. And present at that home, staying in that home, were uh, Lori Vallow, correct? Correct. Uh, at least on the 22nd, J.J. Vallow was there, correct? Sure. Melanie was yeah, there, I can't. Correct? I can't really foresee Chad and testifying. I feel like there's there. no combination where that ends sure. well. Okay. And on that evening, there were they were conducting some sort of a religious podcast, the three of them, correct? Yes. Sir. And uh, the allegation is that JJ was acting up and went into the pair of um, of um, Alex Cox. Correct. And then Alex took JJ into a separate apartment, correct? On, on which day? On the 22nd? He took him to apartment 107, correct? Right. His apartment or whoever was on the lease for that apartment, right? That's right. Okay. And then the last time that anybody saw JJ... Do we get some food, Castro? Um, we'll be fine. Later that evening, is that Oh, fair? you don't know what you want? Yes. Oh, typical woman. Doesn't Alex know what she Cox wants to eat. Color me surprised. JJ Vallow into the apartment eh? of eh? David. You know you laughed. Right? 
We were all staying there together, correct? That's correct. And then somewhere at that point, whether it was at that point or subsequent to that evening or that evening, um, that's when you believe that uh, J.J. Vallow was murdered. That's correct. Okay. But the next morning, um, the next morning, uh, there were three people in the apartment at, at that time early in the morning, correct? Jackson Foundation. Well, do you know who was in the apartment early that morning on the 23rd? Mr. Pryor? There's an objection. I think that was all sustained. Do you have any knowledge of who was in the apartment on the 23rd of September, the morning of that morning of 2019? Yes. And who was there? David Warwick, Melanie Gibb, and Mary Mallow. Okay. And at that point, you believe that um, J.J. Mallow was already dead? I can't testify to the time, but I believe he was killed. Okay. But then within two hours later from that morning, you believe that he was buried on Chad Davos property. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. Okay. Um, you had an occasion to talk with Melanie Gibb and David Warwick. Is that right? That's right. <clears throat> now, and you did it a couple of times, if I recall. One by phone, right? With Melanie Gibb? Correct. And that wasn't recorded, was it? Um, and it was recorded. It was recorded? With her attorney. No. No, I'm talking about a regular phone call with Melody Gibb without an attorney. Uh, I don't remember a phone call. Okay. All right. We're going to revisit that maybe at another date, but uh, that's fine. But you also went down to um, uh, Provo, Utah. And I'm, I'm going off of memory, but it was Provo, Utah on the 4th of June of 2020. Is that right? Sure. Now, at that point, um, you were interviewing both David Warwick and Melanie Gibb about information they had about this, these allegations, correct? Correct. Okay. And um, who, was else, who else was there? Um, myself, Lieutenant Paul, uh, and prosecutor. Yeah, okay, prior so questions are also attorney, not particularly well organized. Lee. Right there, and um, a lieutenant that you work with. I'm presuming that this witness testified at Lori's trial, right. and, was and therefore he have a pretty decent idea as well? what his testimony is going to look like, okay. and could and ask now, and write in some of his cross in advance. Uh, record that conversation. Is that right? Yes, it was recorded. Okay, was the entire thing recorded? Uh, I believe the very beginning wasn't the, the uh, recording malfunctioned or something happened that was recorded, but the majority of that interview was recorded. The majority of it was recorded. That's correct. So if I represent to you that uh, there was uh, a 22 minutes... Prior was at the trial? I would hope. Does that sound about the length? Of I mean, I'd hope was that he was, there, he was there at the trial. It doesn't? I'd be. Okay. Um, Free preview of the state's case. To listen to that recording, yeah. To that recording to refresh your recollection. Refresh my recollection. Like about the length of time that recording was? It should have been longer than 22 minutes. Okay. Yeah, there longer than 22 minutes. How long were you there? Uh, roughly, say about an hour, maybe. Okay. Now, your, your testimony is that it should have been longer than 21 or 22 minutes. Is that right? That's correct. Would it surprise you to learn that, uh, well, you don't know exactly how long that interview took place, though, right? Uh, yeah, I, I couldn't tell you the exact time. And you don't know the length of the recording itself. Is that fair? That's fair. Okay, and in order to determine that, it would be helpful for you to refresh your recollection by listening to the interview, and it would be able to answer those questions for you. Is that fair? 
That's fair. You know, I'm going to check beyond the scope. We're way beyond the scope of your, your red castle. If also the officer is going to review that, and I permit it, of course, it's not going to be in the presence of the jury. Uh, so I'll sustain the objection on the beyond the scope. Judge, are you talking about the on the scope of direct examination? Yes. Okay, then officer, we'll revisit that at another time, okay? And we'll leave that for another opportunity um, when I call you back. Now, okay. um, on the day that- He wants uh, to call him in his case in chief, Gigi okay. Gigi was found in June 9th, on June 9th, okay? Your, your, the pictures and the testimony you showed suggested that he was wearing um, red pajamas and some Skechers socks. Is that right? Sure. Okay. Do you have a recollection of what JJ Bella was wearing based on your investigation when he was carried by Alex Cox from uh, Alex Cox's apartment to the upstairs of upstairs of Lori Vallow's apartment? Objections, calls for hearsay. It doesn't necessarily call for hearsay. He's wondering what he observed him wearing, you know, so. Yes. That's how we're on that. You know, tell me if you know the answer. I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Okay. Do you know whether or not J.J. Vallo was wearing red pajamas when he was carried upstairs by Alex Cox? Sir, I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. okay. And Judge, I think at this point, um, I'm going to save the rest of my questioning for uh, when I call the officer back in my case in chief. That's okay. Very well. You do that. I'll conclude the cross examination then. Uh, this time we'll begin with redirect from the state. Mr. Wood. I, I don't really know what the defense got from that, if anything, to be really honest. I don't really didn't really feel like the defense scored any points. I'm not really 100% sure what they were trying to do. Um, so not ideal, it seems to me. Your Honor, may I be handed States Exhibit 31? Yes, and States Exhibit 30. Detective, you testified earlier about when you first met Alex or Chad Daniel. Correct. Who was he with? Alex Cox. Did he look afraid of Alex Cox? I don't know. Alex Cox was Chad Daniel's brother in law, correct? When you met him? That's correct. Detective, so you were you were asked about your beliefs that that there in in cross examination you were asked about your beliefs. Yes. Let's talk about your investigation. This when could be a long trial, that's for sure. What was the scope of your investigation? Initially, it was to find um, the Jeep from Gilbert, Arizona. And then it expanded, correct? Correct. And then what was the scope of your investigation? To find the whereabouts of JJ and Tylee. And all this time you're collecting information from various sources. That's correct. Your Honor, may I publish <laughs> States Exhibit 31? Yes. Detective, you, again, you were, you were asked about your beliefs, correct? 
That's correct. And you were asked about your beliefs regarding, I'm going to call it the paintball incident. Is that fair? Yes. And when I'm talking about that, what, what do you, to your understanding, what am I referring to? To the shooting of Timmy Dibble. And you testified you don't believe it was a paintball gun. That's correct. So why not? Through our investigation, we learned that Alex Cox was in the area and on the property of Chad Daybell the morning that Tammy Daybell was shot at October 9th. Through Google searches from Homer J. Maximus, which was Alex's Google account, the night that Tammy Daybell was shot, it was a colder evening. And the Google searches were uh, about making AR-15 function in the cold weather. And without referring to my notes, I can I refer to my notes. Would it refresh your memory to review your notes? Yes, sir. Your Honor, may the, may the witness look at his report. No objections. Yes, you can look at it, uh, not to testify from to refresh your recollections. So once you look at that, it's now. Do you think it's possible to take desktop audio on October 8th and using board, like uh, we believe can be shot at some tool drop yardage from make it look like a microphone yards, um, which we assumed uh, when you're shooting a rifle you're you're adjusting your sights to your target. That was the night before. The morning of the shooting, Alex was on Mr. Daybell's property. Um, we have him driving up and down the road on Mr. Daybell's property and also on the property. Later that evening into the early morning hours of October 10th. Can you use voice meter or something? You will not make your AR-15 function in cold weather. Um, yeah. So that's why. So I, I have a way to potentially improve the audio of the court. I can run it through voice mod and voice mod might be able to clean it up, but voice mod is only voice mod as a tool only takes microphone inputs. So what I need to do is I need to make the desktop audio look like a microphone input so that I can put it into voice mod and see if I can get it cleaned up. So, can I do that? Have any bearing on whether or not you believe it was a paintball gun? Yes. The fact that uh, Chad Daybell got married- I might be able to make the audio sound like not garbage. Whether or not it was a paintball gun, Yes. The fact that there were two children buried on Chad Daybell's property have any bearing on whether or not you believe it was a paintball gun? Yes. Did the fact that Lori Hub, well, did the fact that Lori Bell's husband died 
within months of these other deaths have any bearing on your belief of whether or not it was a pain bubble? Absolutely. Yeah. So can I make it, can I run it through? On October 2nd, 2019, have any bearing on your belief of whether or not it was a pain bubble? Yes. Can I run it through and like voice meter or something? Was tied to these events, correct? That's correct. Yeah. And because you were asked about your beliefs, was it your belief that Chad Daybell is tied to these events? Yes. Why? Let's Based find out. On our investigation, the 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 lies that we've been told, the fact that uh, we're trying to get a hold of well, the kids' mother, Roy Bell, it won't work actually. Father, Chad because you would still hear it. Um, their uncle, Alex no, I can Cox, fake that too. I can I can fake that too, so you wouldn't hear it. Were, um, left in the dark. Okay. Based on all those events, that's what our beliefs were as a collectively. Pursuant to your investigation, you know when Alex Cox died? December 12th, 2019. At any time after Alex Cox died, did Mr. Daybell call the Rexburg police to report that there might be dead children located on his property? No, he didn't. Did he call the Rexburg police? With Let's try and see if I can do something with voice meter. No, he didn't. Did he call the Rexburg police before Alex Cox died to say he might be in danger? Judge, we're going beyond the scope. If you walk into a, a desk, there might be an opportunity to uh, revisit those issues. I'm, I'm going to uh, sustain that objection. So okay. that's the word. I have an idea if I can make this work. And if it works, it'll be glorious. Mm. Mm. I'll probably get through all the effort of figuring out how to do it and then it won't work. That'd be my luck, right? Yeah, we'll see. Okay. All right, we got the spinning wheel of death at the moment on the court. Sorry. Regular courtroom will resume at, you know, any time. New audio device detected. Okay.
but that will happen. Guess who's back? Back again. Shady's back. Tell a friend. Guess who's back? Guess who's back? Na 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 na. Yay. Sorry for the uh, difficulty. All right, John, so if you'll give me a moment, I want to clarify our record on exhibits admitted through that last witness to make sure the court has a clear record what came in as it relates to exhibit 34. So we did have a stipulation that on the record here and for the jurors to know as well, we had, uh, I believe 34 had separate attachments or it would be separate exhibits, 34 A, B, C, D, and E. Is that what 34 consists of? Yes, Judge, and the state is stipulated to the admission of all of uh, 34, which included those separate exhibits. They voted this. Okay, and understanding they were stipulated to it's still on the record, I'm going to make clear that exhibits 34A, 34B, 34C, 34D, and 34E have all been admitted into the record and our evidence in the case. Does the state concur with that? That sounds accurate, Your Honor. Okay. Check one, two. Check one, two. Okay. Yeah, so we'll be included, I'll have you stick around for a minute to also see if we need to further clarify as if it's on the record. Uh, at this time, ladies and gentlemen of the jury and those in attendance, I have discussed scheduling here with counsel. Uh, we got this trial started and moving along with jury selection a little quicker than anticipated, and the state is at its stage of putting on its case in chief. They're doing their best to line up witnesses to appear here coming a little sooner than anticipated. Thank you, Kate, and for the dollar ninety nine. We are going to go ahead and conclude for today. Okay, well, and we're done for the day. To have a full day's worth of evidence and testimony. All right, well, and we're done for the day. So that uh, that brings us to the end of today. So <laughs> that was funny. Yeah. So maybe I'll try to um, figure out if I can do something with the audio. See if there's some way for me to clean it up at all. If I could run it through something, you know, I don't know. But we'll see. I'll see if I can do anything with the audio at all, and make it any better at all. Clean it up at a better. I'll see what I can do. Uh, we will be on tonight for uh, Thursday night Thunderdome. So we'll be on in about four hours, three and a half hours, and then we'll be on tomorrow as well. So that will be exciting. Oh, there is no coverage tomorrow. That's right. The court's off tomorrow. So that's right. Fair enough. So tomorrow gives me a good opportunity to play with the audio settings a little bit. See what I can do. Maybe I can make it out. Talk to Recovery Addict? Yeah. Yeah. I'll see what I can do. So I'll see what I can do. All right, guys. I'm going to sign off for now. We will be back uh, tonight. And then we will be back uh, Monday, I guess. Oh, I do have more to read to you because we didn't we we did we did have to finish the finish a chapter or something. Plus, you guys have been good, and I love you. All right, chapter thirteen, where we left things off. For those of you who've forgotten, by the way, we are reading Chad Daybell's book, The Defendant, wrote a series of books. We are reading book one of five of a Left Behind clone. When we last left the action, the Mormon church was, was in the hills and in, in fleeing civilization. And only a month after the Mormon church 
left for the hills. Civilization has basically descended into complete hellscape. You know, pornography is being shown on TV and, uh, and you know, everything, as in anything goes world and everything's gone completely to shit. Um, when we last left the action, however, Tad, our protagonist, his fate was yet uncertain because he had stayed behind even though his family went to the hills. So will he go to the hills? Will he not go to the hills? All right, let's read some more from chapter 13. It was now June and Tad still hadn't been to Springfield since the faithful day a month earlier when Emma had left with the kids. He knew they were now at the Jolly Ranch campground, but he just couldn't convince himself to drive up the canyon. He had heard that all the mountain camps were surrounded by fences and he didn't want to have to explain to himself to anyone at the gate. Besides, he had no intention of staying at the camp, and he doubted they had a visitor's pass. Plus, the guilt of still having the chip in his hand deterred him from wanting to see his family. He loved them dearly, but he couldn't bear to see their pained expressions. He was sure his sons had lost respect for him. The more practical reason he hadn't gone to Springville was that Emma had taken the minivan. He could have gone there by the tracks train, but then he'd have to walk through several blocks through downtown Springville, and the streets weren't as safe as they once were. Finally, he decided to cash his $2,000 chip check and use the money okay. Finally, he decided to cash his $2,000 chip check and use the money as a down payment on a little 2009 Porsche sports car. The car was a few years old, but it was really fun to drive and it, he had negotiated a good deal on it. That evening, Tad zoomed through Springfield, telling himself that it was his duty to make sure the Dalton's house was kept in good shape and hadn't been vandalized. As he pulled in front of the house, he saw their minivan parked in the driveway with a note taped to the windshield. He grabbed the note and saw it was in Emma's handwriting. It read, Tad, you can use the van. We won't be using it anymore. Tad crumpled up the note. You'll need the van when you get back, he said, as he glanced at his shiny silver Porsche. Besides, the van has been replaced. Tad decided to attend his West Jordan War the following Sunday, more out of boredom than anything. But he was curious to see how the remaining members were going to adapt without any leaders. His neighbors had told him the whole bishopric and all the ward leaders had gone to their stake assigned camp in Little, in little Cottonwood Canyon. Tad entered the chapel and set, settled into a pew. There were about 40 people in attendance. He glanced up at the stand and was stunned to see a man named Larry Campbell sitting in the bishop's seat. Now I know I'm not living right, Tad said to himself. Larry had once been a prominent Salt Lake attorney but he was sent to, sent to prison for several months for fraud. He lost all of his assets, including his big mansion in East Salt Lake. While he was in prison, he had been hit in the head with a pipe and became somewhat of a religious zealot who sometimes called himself Sherman, Sherman, after a person in the Book of Mormon. He was best known for writing strange letters to the Desert News, asking to have a debate with the prophet. Larry had been released from prison three months earlier and was living in a halfway house in the ward boundaries. Now with the bishopric gone, he seemed eager to fill the vacancy. Larry stood up at the pulpit and said, brothers and sisters, the spirit has called me to be the new bishop of the ward. Everyone looked up at each other. Never had there been a more unlikely bishop. Larry then pointed at Tad and said, brother North, the spirit has moved me to call you as my first counselor. Please join me on the stand. Tad may have been going through a spiritual crisis, but he was certain the Lord had not called him to be Larry Campbell's counselor. Tad called out, no thanks, Larry. I think I'm going to find another ward. Larry glared at him. Brother North, if you reject this calling, you'll be cursed by the Lord. Tad laughed out loud. Is this what a spiritual life would become? Larry, I'm not sure things could get much worse for me, but I appreciate the warning. I wish you the best this bishop. T. Cancella gives 999 saying, thank Kurtz, you're the best. Great wit, sarcasm, and always a brilliant analysis. And you love your viewers' attempt to enough to fix the court crap audio. You make me smile here in Greenville. Well, that's awesome. And I do love our Greenville people. Kick ass.
Tad walked out of the chapel and never returned. Within a week, he had heard that Larry was back in prison for a parole violation, and soon the, and soon the ward's meeting house was empty each Sunday. Tad actually had a lot more to worry about besides Larry. Campbell's supposed curse, as the summer progressed, the nation's economy took a major downturn. Everyone had rushed to spend their chip money on electronic gadgets and vacations, and suppliers rushed to meet the demand. They ended up flooding the market with too much merchandise and depressing prices. The temporary economic boom was clearly over, and economists predicted a major recession heading into the second half of the year. Those dire estimates sent shock through Wall Street and stocks fell rapidly. Millions of investors watched in despair as the value of their 401k plans and investment portfolios plummeted. Throughout the nation, the level of violent crime rose dramatically, particularly in the eastern United States. Urban areas such as northern New Jersey and southern Florida were quickly evolving into battle zones. The National Guard claimed to be monitoring those areas, but they were basically guarding the freeway exits using tear gas and water cannons to keep people from leaving those areas. The people were essentially being held hostage by their own government, but, po but the politicians didn't want to spread the violence. Or didn't want the violence to spread. Unspeakable horrors were continually taking place among the citizens in those areas, which media euphemistically referred to as red zones. The number of red zone murders that summer were never ta tallied, but they easily totaled into the thousands. Meanwhile, the federal government had become a huge logjam as Republican and Democratic leaders in Congress refused to cooperate on major issues. The U.S. president, who just weeks earlier had been a national hero for the CHIP reimbursement program, was being rightly blamed for propping up everyone's hope with a short-term solution that hadn't really solved anything. Publicly, the president acted if nothing was wrong. He continually asked the American people to move forward unitedly. He even unveiled his plans to run for re-election, but he knew the nation was in serious trouble. He admitted to his top aides that the country's financial quagmire was beyond repair. Wow. Wow. I mean, I, I hate to point out the obvious, but like cutting basically everyone a $2,000 check uh, isn't going to crash the economy that hard. Um... Yeah. What would that be? Like there's three there's three hundred and fifty million Americans. So I, I suppose I don't know who we're counting in this, but two thousand times three hundred and fifty million is what? Seven hundred billion? That sound that sounds like a weekend for the federal government. I mean, you know. Yeah. As the week passed, Tad continued to go to work. Desperate the weakening economy and general national unrest, the accounting firm was still doing well. Tad had kept his promises and was promoted with a substantial bonus and raise. Well, I'm not sure how much it matters at this point, but okay. He moved out of the Sandy apartment and rented a small one-bedroom apartment in City Creek Center, just across the plaza from his office. He told himself the arrangement would work well for him until Emma and the kids came back from the mountains. Hey, Tad, the kids are not coming back, man. Now that he didn't have to worry about the lengthy commute, he could work late each night, except on nights of the Gladiators game. Despite his promise to Emma, he had never sold the tickets, and he had still attended every game with a couple of friends as a way to cope with his lonely, dull life. Tad had actually enjoyed going to the movies when he was younger, but now there just wasn't anything he wanted to see. There were some new sequels in the theater that summer, but Tad felt the Pirates of the Caribbean series had run out of steam after the fifth film, and Spider-Man movies were a joke now without any of the original actors. However, Tad did, however, Tad did have high hopes for Shrek, the seventh son. The initial reports were that it was a funnier film than its predecessor, the way too serious Six Degrees of Shrek. But after reading a review that said the new movie was rated R for extreme profanity and animated nudity, he gave up on what Hollywood had to offer.
So with his new raise, a dismal social life and no one to feed by himself, Tad quickly paid off all the financial debts, including the new car. In fact, he soon had $10,000 sitting in his savings account. How nice for Tad. Now he just was waiting for Emma to choose to return home so they could be together in Springfield just as she had always wanted. She's not coming back, Tad. Following his job promotion, Tad was given a corner office that had a clear view of Salt Lake Temple. The room around town was the prophet and some of the apostles were living there, and Tad often did see lights shining in the temple's upper windows. Of course, the temple hadn't been open to the public since the saints had departed for the mountains. Some vandals tried to break in and actually wrote graffiti on the temple's outside walls. Within a few days of the incident, a group of men had cleaned off the graffiti and then quietly and efficiently assembled a 12-foot-high metal fence on the sidewalk all the way around Temple Square, similar to the fences that had been constructed around many of the mountain camps. They also fenced off blocks that held the conference center, the Joseph Smith building, and the church office building. The next group of thugs that tried to vandalize the temple discovered the hard way that the fence had been electrified. That put a quick stop to the vandalism. A few weeks later, arsonists burned the Jordan River Temple, and soon all the temples received the same fencing. Tad wasn't sure who put them up, since all the saints were supposedly in the mountains, but Tad wasn't aware that before the migration to the mountains, the church had specifically called 300 men as maintenance missionaries who were living unnoticed in Salt Lake City, or Salt Lake Valley, Blending in with the remaining citizens, these men served as the church's eyes on the streets by keeping the church's leaders notified of any troublesome situations. These missionaries were unknown to the world, but they were organized into districts and zones, and even had a mission president who coordinated their actions. For example, he had directed them to buy fencing for the temples at various stores along the Watashaw front to avoid attracting attention. And then they met at a designated temple and assembled the fence at night with hardly, without hardly being noticed. They then also watched over the ward meeting houses and other church properties. As fall approached, the nation prepared to commemorate Patriot Day on September 11th in memory of the victims of the World Trade Center attacks more than a decade earlier. That's not true. The World Trade Center attacks were only like a couple of years ago, right guys? Right? Right? Yeah. There had been major national tragedies in the following years, but that day still marked a turning point in the history of the world. Many older people could seemingly remember the seemingly carefree era before 9-11 and created a longing for the good old days. The citizens didn't realize they were on the verge of a series of events that would put 9-11 in the distant past forever. Wow. Wow. End of chapter 13. Exciting. So, uh, things are not going great over here, although Tad appears to be doing okay financially. But, uh, you know, well, yeah. And apparently 9-11 times a million is uh, coming down the pike. So, something to prepare for, I guess. How exciting. Well, my friends, I think that will bring us to the end of the stream. We've done everything we need to do here today. We will be on tonight with Thursday Night Thunderdome. That should be fun. And until then, I hope all is well. Cheers, my friends, 